Hello and welcome to Data Basic, a Warwick Data Science Society podcast aimed at making data science simple and accessible by discussing the latest developments in the field. I'm Srinivas Billa, a third year data science student, and in this episode we will be talking to Hannah Smith, who is a strategic consultant at EMI about the programming language Julia. In addition, we will have a short segment about the dangers of relying too heavily on metrics for machine learning. But first, let's say hello to Hannes. I am joined here by Hannes Smith. To start off, could you perhaps give a high-level description of what you do? Uh, Yeah, so I went to Exeter University where I did an integrated master's in maths, uh, but I really just focused on statistics in that. Then after graduating uh, about a year ago, I started working for Amy Strategic Consulting, where I've been an analyst on a whole bunch of different projects, uh, doing data science, development, uh, and a whole lot of different things. First of all, your background follows an interesting trajectory from pure mathematics to working in data-centric consultancy roles. Can you talk us through how you made that transition? Yeah, so uh, at the beginning, I found it quite exciting and very different to what I was doing in university, doing like a dissertation that was very research focused. And then at work, I was being given a task and then I had to start from nothing and try and analyze some data and figure out what was actually happening inside the data. But uh, that was the part that I actually really enjoyed. And I was very confident with doing that kind of thing, even if I the the results I gave weren't always what they wanted. I, I felt like I was like really doing a good job. The uh, the part that I'm not so confident on is the consultancy part, where there's a lot of um, asking for requirements from the client and meeting and understanding what they're doing. And that communication side is something that, even though I knew it was part of the job, I didn't like. I'd heard people say, "Oh, yeah, it's a, a big part of being a data scientist is about like communication and getting the the results you have, getting that across, and getting the requirements across." But that was the part I struggled a bit with. I, I like to think that I'm a lot better at it now, and I actually uh, understand what I'm doing with that. But that was a, a bit of a challenge for me. Yeah, I understand because as a data science student, sometimes I find it difficult to present my findings to, for example, someone interested in my work, but they're not really a data centric person. Yeah, they're, if they're not a data kind of person, then there's a lot of assumptions that you make when you talk to other data kind of people. You you can say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this kind of regression, blah, blah, blah. But that means nothing to most people. So you have to explain like, OK, so these are some inputs and this is the output I got. What does this number even mean? You have to be like, OK, well, this means that these things are kind of correlated. But what does that even mean? It means uh, they don't cause each other. They're sort of just linked in some way. That's the part that's difficult, and you just get better at that with practice. Can you give an example of the sort of work you do and how you use data science to achieve the outcomes? Yeah, so one of the great things about consultancy is the great variety that you get. So I've done analysis for things like the gender pay gap or potholes in Staffordshire. And at the moment, I'm doing some full stack development, so working from a database all the way up to like a front end and things like that. Um, the, uh, so this project is in partnership with Kent County Council. We're doing a trial using some sensors that we've developed uh, at Amy, uh, where I work. So there's some IoT sensors with uh, a small battery and some sensors that are collecting data all the time. And so it's my job to take those messages containing the data, transform them, put them in a database, and then build the front end with a UI and some graphs that will show that data to a human that can then get some insight out of it. And it's been really exciting, but a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but I've really, I've learned so much about it. And um, yeah, it's, it's been really great. As of lockdown, I presume a lot of students who have free time in the summer are looking for something to do. So what skills do you recommend they pick up before they start off for the new academic year? Yeah, so this really depends on what kind of thing you're going to be doing. So I, I think if you're going to be doing a lot of statistics in your degree anyway, then it might be a good idea to learn something that you won't learn in lectures, something that's com- kind of out there. So for me, at the moment, I'm learning causal inference, which is something I didn't really know about until very recently. I didn't learn anything about it in my degree. I found some free lectures on YouTube and I've been learning all about it and it's been really fun. So if you're doing a lot of data stuff already, that might be something to look into. Not necessarily that, but something out there a bit. But if you're just new to data science or you just want some experience, then I would definitely say try doing a project. Like it's one of the most important things if you want to get a job in data science. Find some free data online. Don't use like the Titanic data set or anything because that's been done so many times. But just make like a Jupyter notebook or write a blog post. It doesn't have to be some groundbreaking new analysis. It can just be stuff you know and stuff you're just learning you pick up along the way. But have some kind of thing where you start off with some data you don't know anything about. And by the end of it, you've written uh, some conclusions and you've made some kind of model or something. Or you've had a hypothesis and you've tested it. And then having that on your CV it's immediately something that every interviewer will just, they will latch onto it and they'll ask you questions about it. And that's great because in the interview, this is the one part of the interview where 
you are the one who's the expert. They're not asking you stuff that they know about. They're asking you because they're genuinely interested and like you can be the expert and say, oh, this is what I did. These are the challenges I faced. And it, it really looks impressive. This was uh, one of the things that I think got me this job that I'm in at the moment. So I highly recommend doing that. We will be right back after this segment to discuss the programming language Julia and whether it is something you should consider learning. Let me tell you a story about a man and his dog. And just trust me, this does have something to do with data science. It takes place in Paris, 1908, alongside the banks of the River Seine. One day, the stillness of the winter air was broken by the cries of a small child having fallen into the waters after playing on the riverside. With few around, the child was at serious risk of drowning. That is, if it wasn't for a brave Newfoundland dog that bounded into the icy stream to rescue this helpless victim. Naturally, once the owner discovered his dog's heroic efforts, he petted him, praised him, and finally presented him with a succulent slice of steak. You might think this is where the story ends, but no. Just two days later, another child, also playing alongside the Seine, fell victim to a similar fate. Don't fear though, because the same dog proudly saved the child, dragging it to the shore to be praised just the same as before. At this point, the neighbourhood was undoubtedly curious. Was there a serial child abuser in the area, pushing any unsuspecting child into the frozen current? It wasn't too long until an answer to this question was found. Yes, there was a serial offender, and his game soon stopped once he was caught red-handed. Or perhaps I should say, red-pawed. You heard that right. This clever dog had made a discovery. If, whenever it saw a child playing near the river, it was to knock the child in, just to immediately pull them back out, he would have established himself a near-infinite supply of steak. That is, until he was caught in the act, and the stream of treats promptly ran dry. What can we learn from this tale, and how can it help us in our practice of data science? This anecdote is an example of Goodhart's law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. In this case, our measure for success was the dog pulling a child out of the river. The problem is, by focusing too closely on this as our target, the dog quickly learned that it could cheat the system by pushing in the children itself. Goodhart's law appears everywhere. When Soviet factories were given targets based on the number of nails they produced, the nails shrunk in size to the point of becoming useless. When weight became the new target, they grew to comical proportions. Or how about in India, when the government offered money for each dead cobra that was turned in, in an attempt to reduce the abundance of loose cobra snakes? Much to the government's disdain, citizens started breeding their own cobras to game the system. Once the government became wise to this and ended the scheme, these were then released out into the wild, making the problem far worse than it was in the beginning. There are also many data scientific examples of Goodhart's law. It's easy to obsess over the accuracy of a model, forgetting to consider how such accuracy was attained. Perhaps your data set was unbalanced, and your model has learnt to bias its answers towards one class. For example, when trying to predict whether patients have a rare disease, guessing no for everyone will always give rise to high accuracy. Even worse, perhaps your data set is not representative of the real world. A classic example is that of Alvin, a self-driving car from the late 80s. Its performance was incredible, until it reached a bridge, at which point it lurched around so dangerously with motion so manic that the researchers had to take control. What went wrong? Later model inspection revealed that Alvin actually wasn't that good at driving, but rather had learnt that if it kept the grassy verge on the side of the road to its left, it was doing just fine. This worked great until a bridge approached and the verge disappeared, leading to chaos. So how do we come up with an ungameable metric, one that is robust to Goodhart's law? The answer is, we don't. Instead, we use a combination of metrics, heuristics, and careful and thoughtful analysis of our model to try and understand how and why it came to its decisions. And most importantly, if we keep Goodhart's law at the front of our mind, we're much less likely to fall for it in the future. Despite having been around for close to a decade now, the programming language Julia has only recently started to gain major traction with the breadth of its use cases growing wider all the time. What is your experience with Julia and what do you use it for? Yeah, so I heard about this thing called Julia maybe two years ago. Um, and the main thing I heard about it was it was the first two letters of Jupyter Notebooks. So JU comes from Julia, the PYT comes from Python and the R comes from R. And that was really all I knew about it. it was like, oh yeah, it's some language that people sometimes use. It's not as popular as R or Python, so I didn't really pay much attention to it. 
Um, and then about a year ago, I stumbled upon a YouTube video from the Julia Convention 2019. Uh, it was called Cleaning Messy Data with Julia. And it was about this thing called probabilistic programming that I'd never heard about. And it seemed really cool how uh, the team had managed to like make a whole new language inside another language of Julia. And then they were doing all this crazy stuff that I'd never seen before. It just seemed so cool that I was like, ah, I have to give this a try. Like It, it just seemed like uh, something I definitely wanted to give a go. And then so about... Yeah, about a year ago now, I started learning some basic stuff in Julia, how to do the, the things I already knew how to do in R and Python, and relearning that. And then also learning some whole new things. Uh, there's loads of stuff about Julia that makes it quite unique compared to other languages. Uh, things like multiple dispatch and all these complicated words that I still don't really understand. But uh, all these things I found really exciting, and I've done some development in it, and I've done some data analysis and trying to build some simulations. Uh, none of it has been particularly good, but it's all been really uh, exciting for me to learn, and I really just enjoy using Julia. It's the same way that I, when I started learning R, I felt it was so cool to be able to analyze all this data and make a, a cool graph doing all these things. I have that same feeling again learning Julia of like, wow, this really feels like something new and something that um, is really fun to learn for me. You mentioned how Python and R are very similar to Julia for data-centric applications. However, the former two have mature ecosystems with extensive libraries and community support. How does Julia compare? Yeah, so this is a, a comparison that is unfortunately uh, not in Julia's favor. So my impression is that Julia is already really great for anything that you might call like scientific computing. So if you're doing like differential equations, there's a differential equations package for Julia, which is basically, my impression is that it's like the best in the world, basically, like there's nothing better than it. Or there's a package called Jump for optimization. And that seems to be like a world class optimization package. So if you're only doing anything in those fields or similar fields, or if you're doing anything in MATLAB, basically, you can just switch to Julia right now, rewrite some of your code and keep some of it the same. Uh, MATLAB's similar to Julia in that way. And then you'll get like a 10, maybe 100 times speed up with Julia. And it will just be a lot more usable than MATLAB or anything similar like that or Python and R. But so having said all that, for data science, the package ecosystem in Julia is not really as stable as it could be. They're really getting there. Um, the data frames package is pretty close to a version 1.0. So keeping in mind that Pandas only recently uh, reached 1.0, it's not that bad. But I think because Julia has a, a very atomic way of having these packages, and by that I mean like each package does one thing and it does it well, what this ends up being is like quite a fragmented ecosystem of things that actually end up working quite well together. It's a bit weird coming from R and Python where you have things like uh, scikit-learn in Python where you have every single machine learning algorithm you could ever want or pandas which does I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of things. I don't even know half of the things that pandas does. Or as in Julia, the data frames package, all it does is have one thing called a data frame and it has columns and you can move the columns around and you can modify them and you can do some pivots maybe and, and that's about it. And then you have all these other packages that are sort of springing up around that that are interoperating with it. And so you have uh, things like Queryverse, which is like a bit like the Tidyverse, or you have DataFrames Meta, which is another uh, manipulation package for data frames. These are all uh, separate packages that can all modify these data frames in a interesting and cool ways. And when you use them, it feels really like, wow, I'm like, it's so cool that these two packages are working together so well. And um, it has quite a cool feeling to it. But not everything is, is there that you might want. Like, I can't think of any I, things off the top of my head, but there's just occasionally you'll run into like, oh, how do I do this thing in Julia? And then that's when having all these separate packages is less than ideal. Because then you're going, oh, which package has this thing? Like, is there a package that does this? And luckily, there is a really helpful community around Julia. So you can ask on the forum on the website or on there's a Slack group for people doing Julia. And the people there are really helpful and they'll answer your question. But it does still have that problem of having all these separate packages, which can sometimes be a great thing and then sometimes be a bit of a annoying frustration of trying to find the exact thing and maybe it's a bit out of date or doesn't work well. But it's getting there for data science. And I think maybe in the next few years, it will start to be stable enough that it can be used properly in production for things. It already is used a little bit in production in some places, but... Uh, I'd like to think that in maybe a year or two, we'll see it be properly up there with R and Python actually used in companies and for research and stuff like that. Regarding the point you made about atomic packages, it's similar to the conversation in Python about using Django or Flask, the former offering more built-in functionality at the cost of a more bloated toolset. 
Yeah, I think that when you have everything done for you, that's great as long as you want to do the things that it does for you. As soon as you want to do something that it just quite can't quite do, then you're suddenly having to like extend this massive giant package like Django or something. You have to write an extension for Django. That seems much more intimidating because there's so much already there that you need to work your way through. Whereas with Flask, it's nice and simple. And writing an extension for Flask, I haven't actually done it, but I imagine it would be simpler because Flask is simpler in and of itself. And the same thing with Julia, where if you want to extend data frames, this is like, per- Julia's perfect for that. It can You can make your own extension for data frames that has a new column for color, and it will, I don't know, <laughs> do something special with colors. If you want to make a, a color data frames package, you can do that. It's really simple. Whereas with pandas, if I wanted to extend pandas, I'd have no idea where to start. It's written in like C, C++, a lot of it. And so there's a lot of stuff that you need to get your head around to even think about doing something that's not supported by pandas. Another point you picked up on that I wanted to discuss is the difference in speed compared to Python, and especially the difference in having an interpreted language and a just-in-time or JIT-compiled one. Could you explain why this is and whether it influences decisions into using Julia? Yeah, so one of the aims when Julia was created was to solve what they call the two-language problem. So this is where, if you were a researcher, you'll write some code in, say, Python, and then you'll reach a point where your code ends up being too slow or you'll have some bottleneck in your code where you're doing a for loop and it's just taking ages. And at that point, you kind of have two choices. So you can either write some kind of C package extension thing that will call C and then that will uh, speed up that little bottleneck. Or you can take your code and then rewrite everything in a faster language like C or I don't know, Java or something. And so Julia tries to be both of those languages at the same time. So it's uh, fast and easy to use in that you can like get your ideas down quickly and, and start iterating quickly but then it's also fast as in it's really quick to run and if you write some code it will like it will blaze through a for loop at similar speeds to like C or things like that and so the way it does that is by being just in time compiled or JIT compiled so to explain that you have languages like C or Rust or something um, where you will write some code and then there's a thing called a compiler which will turn those code that code into instructions for your computer, basically. And those instructions are very fast on that computer, but that com- compilation time takes a little bit of time. It ends up being slower, and you can't just uh, suddenly recompile all your code and just make one change and have it rerun. You need to wait for it to all compile. So it's not great for that kind of iterating thing that you often do in data science. And then you have R and Python and some other languages that are interpreted. So this is where there's a program that is reading your code and then executing each of those instructions one by one. And so this is why a for loop in Python ends up being kind of slow compared to doing a vectorized calculation, same in R. And often you'll see people saying, oh, don't use a a for loop in R or Python or whatever, because it'll be really slow. Um, And so Julia tries to be the best of both of these. So it's JIT compiled, which means it's just in time. So every time that you run a function or something in Julia, it will, if it's already compiled it, it can just use that. But if it's not, it will compile it as you run it. And so let's say you have a function that will like clean up a data set and it will do all these things to the columns. The first time you run it, it will sit there and compile it for maybe a second or two, and then it will execute it. But the second time you try and uh, clean a different data set, you have a different input, it can use that function that it's already compiled and it will be just as fast as uh, like running a kind of or similar speeds to running C or Fortran or other compiled languages. And so this ends up being good for both things where it will be quickly you can quickly write down your ideas and execute them and then make some changes if something went wrong but you can also once it's uh, done then you don't need to worry about that code anymore it will just run in i don't know a hundred or sometimes a thousand times faster than uh, r or python and this is like a kind of thing that people often use to advertise julia they're like oh like it's like a hundred times faster than this python thing and yeah a lot of the time that's great but this is actually not one of my biggest uh, things that I love about Julia. It's fine, but uh, to me, the most important thing when I'm doing some data analysis isn't the speed of the code actually executing. It's how quickly I can get my ideas out of my head and into the code. And so with R and Python, that's pretty quick. And with Julia, that is also pretty quick, which is why I think it's quite good. But the actual time that it executes is less important. It's like the difference between a millisecond and 10 milliseconds. Is like I don't really care the difference about that. Um, but the thing where I think it does matter is for developers who are making uh, new machine learning algorithms or something cool like that. That's where Julia is actually really useful because then you can have this developer who's an expert in some machine learning algorithm 
that they're like making a new thing. They can be the expert in that, but they don't also need to be an expert in writing C code or Fortran or something. They can just be using this one language, Julia, and then uh, they can write it quickly in that, and they don't need to suddenly also be an expert in C, um, and they can get their new idea out into the world. And so I think hopefully in the next few years we'll also see Julia being the language used to develop new algorithms or things like that in a much faster and with smaller teams that you couldn't see with uh, things like a TensorFlow or uh, stuff like that that takes like a massive team at Google to develop in Python because they needed to have a whole lot of people that were all experts in machine learning and Python and C and all these things. So Julia can be that language where a small team, they all know Julia and they can all work together in doing the same thing. And there, there are projects in Python like PyPy, which is like a JIT compiled version of Python. Uh, I saw in the news today that they're having a little bit of trouble with their funding and stuff like that, but it's a really interesting project. Uh, the problem with that is it doesn't have all the functions of proper real Python so far. Um, they're working on getting it to the same level, and hopefully one day they can get there and Python code can run. I, don't know, I think I've seen speedups of like 30% or 50% and stuff like that. But for data science, I don't think that's going to be such a big breakthrough as it is for other fields, because things like NumPy, I think it's written in like 51% C, C++. So even if you speed up the Python part of that, there's still the 50% that runs in C that isn't going to see any benefit from that. And NumPy is like pretty fast. I think it's similar speeds to Julia for quite a few things, but I don't know, maybe uh, I think the, the benefits of using Julia mean that 100% of your code will run at that speed instead of just the bits that happen to be written in C or whatever. As someone interested in data science, out of all the programming languages, which would you recommend for students to learn first? Yeah, so the most important thing, I think, is to use the language that your field uses. So if you're doing bioinformatics or something like that, I would just say learn R. Everyone in bioinformatics apparently uses R. Some of them are switching to Julia apparently, but R is like the lingua franca of bioinformatics. And the same thing for like machine learning and Python. It's just so helpful to know Python because everyone else is going to use Python. And so it's just like a necessary thing. If you don't have an obvious choice, like if you're in a field where maybe they're using Excel spreadsheets or something and you want to bring in some more data science stuff, then... Uh, maybe you could try Julia. Like it's definitely something that um, would be uh, interesting and, and quite cool to learn. Uh, if you're doing anything statistics-based, then probably R. And if you're doing anything uh, machine learning-based, then probably Python. And if you're using MATLAB, like I said earlier, I reckon you can just rewrite your code in, in Julia. It won't be that different, and you'll already see a massive speed up. But really, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that much. Like it's... Uh, the skill of being able to program in one language transfers over pretty well, particularly with all these data science-y languages like R and Python and stuff like that. Um, there's a few people at my work who only knew R going into work and they learned Python or, or the opposite where they already knew Python, but they were asked to work on a project that was using R and so they had to learn some of it. And really the, the skills that they knew were enough to get them through and they managed to do it fine. The one additional thing to, with that that I'd say is if you're going to go into some... Uh, very data driven like kind of big data industries the one language that I reckon you have to learn is going to be SQL or some kind of SQL like Postgres or something it's really just super useful I didn't know it going into work and it would have been really useful to know uh, if you're going into something more academic or uh, going into a PhD it's not really necessary but um, yeah anything in industry SQL is probably a, a really good thing to have on your CV finally Julia is known for its syntax sugar nice features that make coding a bit easier could you give some examples of your favorites? Yeah, so this is like uh, some of the things when I started learning Python was when you want to iterate over uh, a list of things and you also want to have the indices, then you can do the enumerate function and that will just do like a for loop where you get both the index, like one, two, three, four, five, and you also get the element, so you get like A, B, C, D, E. And that kind of feeling I also get with Julia when I do some of these things like uh, there's a thing called the broadcasting operator. So in R, basically all functions are vectorized. So if you give it a vector of one, two, three, and you give it a vector of four, five, six, and you ask it to add those two things together, it knows what to do. It's like, oh, okay, add the first element, add the first element to this one, add the second elements together, add, add the third elements together. Whereas if you're in Python, if you have a system like that, there's a few things, different things you could do. Probably most people will end up doing like a, a list comprehension. So you do like four a, B in this list of things, add A and B and, and do that. So you'd be like 4X in my list, uh, apply this function or something. Uh, Julia has the broadcasting operator, which I think is something similar in MATLAB, where you'll have 
if you have two things that can be iterated over and you have a function that is applied to both of them, if you put a little dot in between the function and the arguments, then it will broadcast it over those arguments. So by that I mean it will make it into from a function that applies to just uh, each element once at a time, it will apply it to all of those elements. And this is just so convenient. And all the places where in Python you would use a, a list comprehension, it's like that, but with just one little extra dot, it's amazing. And it's so convenient to know if you could just look at a function, you can know, oh yeah, this applies to just one element, and then I just add a broadcasting operator, and now it applies to all of them. With no, there's no like speed loss or anything with that. That's really useful. And uh, the other thing that it has is a very powerful macro system that I don't understand, which is why I haven't really brought it up. But uh, the way it works is like you can take the Julia code that you've written and then macro is like a function that instead of taking the inputs and doing some operations on those inputs, it will take the code that you've written as inputs and then it will do some kind of changes to that code. And you can end up writing basically like a DSL, like a domain specific language. You can write a language inside Julia basically is what I'm saying. So you can, uh, things like uh, the jump package for optimization, you can add a little macro that says add this constraint and you can write the constraint that you want and then you can say oh here's another constraint here's a variable this is what this variable does and then the one final macro that's like this is the thing i'm trying to optimize and then you put run at the end and it will go oh yeah let me look at this code and it instead of seeing when it sees x plus three it won't go okay let me look up the value of x x is five five plus three that's eight okay and then spit out the output a macro will look at that and go okay x plus three let me look, take this x and do some operation with that the word x rather than the value of x. And, and so you can get some really powerful stuff out of Julia that you couldn't do in other languages. Or if you could, it would look very complicated. It has been a pleasure to talk to you, Hannes. Thank you for giving us that insight into Julia. Uh, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. And uh, if anyone listening is looking for a graduate job, uh, just so send me an email. My email will be in the description. Uh, send me an email and I'll pass your CV along to my work and I'll see if I can get you a job. Uh, thanks a lot, and it's been a pleasure. Next time, we will be joined by Eric Siegel, author of the Amazon category bestseller Predictive Analytics and a founder of the Predictive Analytics World Conference Series. We will be talking about the impact that predictive science and machine learning can have on a wide variety of industries and the precautions we have to take in utilizing these tools. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram to keep up to date with our podcast and society. With that, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.